As you know, at TechCrunch, we're always looking for the next big thing. This series, Founders in Focus, profiles an early stage startup that we might be hearing a lot about in just a couple of years time. But you may already know Tracy Chow. Here she is talking about her company Block Party with TechCrunch's Jordan Crook, which was recorded a couple of days ago. Today, I am joined by Tracy Chu, who is the founder and CEO of Block Party. Tracy is one of the leading advocates for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the tech world. She also founded Project Include in 2016. Uh, Tracy, can you tell me a little bit? I thought we could just start with what Block Party is. Sure. Um, so Block Party is building consumer tools for online safety and anti-harassment. Um, and it's really all built out of my own experiences dealing with a lot of online harassment, but also um, having worked at a number of the social platform companies and understanding what these sort of incentives are internally and how they think about moderation and safety. Um, with Block Party, we're really taking the kind of end user perspective, the perspective of somebody who may be dealing with harassment and trying to build tools for that. And can you talk to me a little bit, like you, you did say that this was born out of your own experience. I'd like to dig a little bit more into the origin story there and talk about like, you know, every founder at some point takes like, makes one decision that they can not unmake essentially in the path towards starting a company. Can you talk to me about like actually choosing to kind of jump off on the deep end and, and become a founder and like say, okay, this is what I'm going to spend my whole energy and self kind of doing and building right now. Yeah, I think a lot of times people want to hear a narrative that is like there's this very definitive point where something changes, there's an inflection point. I think um, for me throughout my career, it always has been like a buildup of things. So in terms of the harassment, uh, it's been a slow build um, starting from even like 15 years ago, but um, really ramping up over the last few years, um, especially after becoming a little bit more prominent uh, in the tech world for working on diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, uh, and having a little bit more of that platform uh, has engendered more harassment that has risen in the last few years. And so it felt like it became almost inevitable at some point, but it wasn't a singular moment. Um, I guess the specific moment if we had to pick one was when I actually decided to incorporate and you know, um, created the, the entity that is now Blog Party. Um, but the harassment has been ongoing for many years and has taken many different forms from uh, kind of more casual garden variety sexism and misogyny uh, to much more targeted persistent harassment. Um, the kind of common thread through a lot of this is that platforms have not been built well to handle what is often thought of as an edge case. Mm -hmm. And um, there just haven't really been good technical solutions for people who are dealing with um, attacks or just a lot of unwanted content. Um, right. And so like, it was a bit of a realization that uh, there is an opportunity to build better consumer tools on this front, not just rely on platforms themselves or build B2B enterprise solutions to help platforms get better at moderating content, but really trying to center the person who may be dealing with unwanted stuff. Yeah. And you you described it as an edge case, which I find interesting because also, I think we all experienced this, 2020 was bonkers across the board. Um, and I don't think there's ever been one so much access and free time to be on the web and to as much kind of division, particularly in our country. Um, and so that's like a confluence of all these different factors. And I know that for a lot of founders, timing is a huge factor in the success or failure of a company. Do you feel like time in a, in a way is kind of on your side as the rise in online hate kind of grows and access to these tools and we're all just kind of like sitting around at home on our phones um, do you feel like timing is, is kind of like on your side and you're, you're in the pocket, so to speak? The question of timing is a really interesting one because I would argue that online harassment and abuse has been a problem for a very long time. And 
Gamergate is a very obvious example of <laughs> the extreme hate that has transpired in the past and really upturned people's lives. Um, perhaps what is changing is the broader acknowledgement from maybe the majority of folks that it is a problem instead of just from the people who have borne the front of the attacks. Um, I would say that uh, women, minorities, people from marginalized communities have been experiencing a lot of these harms far in advance of the broader acknowledgement of how widespread they are and how um, terrible they can be. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I have observed uh, in my process of working on Block Party, going out and fundraising, talking to potential investors, partners, recruits, is that um, there is still quite a large demographic of folks often the ones who are in positions of power and wealth who can make decisions who don't think that this problem is so bad. Um, even last year, I was getting comments from investor panels that said online abuse is a really niche problem and it seems like it's already being solved. Um, this was last year. Um, oh, and wow. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Talking um, to hear these kinds of comments um, when I know from just personal lived experience that this is a really terrible problem. I know a lot of other people who suffer from it as well. Um, mm -hmm. There's also some research backing it up. Um, research, I think, will always be a bit lagging because there, there are a lot of factors that go into like what things will get funded to, to be researched um, and the incentive of platforms to do research. But I would hazard that there's been quite a few people who could have predicted that this uh, would escalate to a point that you know, we've seen with like January 6th, um, I think right. it's become undeniable, but it's not as if this is a new problem. It's been around for a long time and the voices that have been trying to bring attention to it have just been ignored. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about the fact that you're building a product that is, a, is layered on top of existing platforms and mm -hmm. how you think about that strategically as a founder, both in terms of defensibility and also just flexibility and adaptability. If Twitter or Facebook or one of these platforms maybe makes a drastic change to policy or to an algorithm, what does that mean for Black Block Party and how do you kind of, um, how do you navigate that? Mm -hmm. um. I think the sort of long-term vision is that not only does Block Party build on top of other platforms, like some of the big ones right now that exist, but we start to provide APIs to, to new platforms that want better constructs around safety and moderation. But I think the general direction that I see uh, social media, social platforms moving in is the platforms will always have some responsibility for moderation, for detecting hate, abuse, coordinated activity that's um, inauthentic. But there's another set of um, you know, like preferences that people will always have like on top of what is permissible on platforms. And I think the most tenable way forward is for platforms to open up more APIs to give users more control. It's almost a form of um, consumer protection in a way, which is that you can engage and participate on these platforms, but you should also be able to use extra tools to customize your experience, be able to control your experience better. Uh, so the way I see it is platforms will increasingly start building safety constructs like blocking, muting, reporting. And I think there's starting to be a sea change where platforms recognize they can't solve all these problems by themselves and actually opening up access to these is much better for the platforms as well as for the users. Um, already starting to see this quite a bit with Twitter. Actually, I think they're um, relatively uh, forward thinking on this front. Obviously Twitter has been plagued with a lot of issues around abuse, um, but I'm quite encouraged by um, what they're, they're doing with the API and how they're thinking about supporting a health ecosystem on top of the API instead of trying to claim that they're going to be able to solve everything themselves, recognizing that there is space in the ecosystem for additional players. And so I think that entire um, tone is shifting. I see mm -hmm. it very clearly with Twitter. I am cautiously optimistic that other platforms will start to uh, follow that lead. 
Well, it would make sense to have a team of people who's building a product and spending, you know, 100% of their energy tackling this as opposed to the dozens of other products and policy issues on one of these giant platforms. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I wanted to talk to you about competition a little bit because um, I know that there's an app called Centropy that launched and it was an enterprise product and then it kind of pivoted um, and got some funding. How do you think about competition? How do you advise your team when it comes to competition? Is it something that should be a daily thought? Should you kind of put it to the side? How do you, how do you, how do you manage that? In general with competition, I think it's good to be aware of what else is out there, but it doesn't really change our own roadmap and our execution. The main effect it has on us is motivating us to execute better. We are pretty confident that um, we have strong product direction. We have good intuition around what is useful to people. Mm -hmm. um, And we're going to keep executing on that. I think the, um, the, the competitors that are popping up, pivoting to copy us or just starting to copy, uh, starting out and copying us. There's a, uh, there's a couple others out there like this Mm -hmm. um, are more validation of the market. Um, The fact that they, were unable to find success in the paths they were pursuing before and copying us suggests to me that we have good product intuition are moving in the right directions. Um, and we're not that concerned about specific features that are launching. There are specific reasons why we didn't go for those features, for example, um, not focusing so heavily on things like AI or uh, natural language processing. We have made the decision internally that, that is not what we want to prioritize. And so we're not going to be swayed in terms of our product product roadmap with um, what other folks are focusing on. Yeah. Well, Tracy, unfortunately, we're out of time. I could talk to you about so many other things, but I just wanted to thank you for joining us today. And it was wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much for having me.